The Christadelphians are a group of people that believe the Bible is a book which can be totally relied upon. And we do that in accordance with the words of the Apostle Paul, where he says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And because we believe that it is all scripture that is given by the inspiration to, of God, tonight, as we look at scriptures to support what we are trying to say, when we are trying to understand God's teaching on prophecy, we will look, refer to scriptures from Genesis through to Revelation. Now, prophecy is something which is given as a help in, to us in the Bible that we may be able to accept that the Bible is reliable. Prophecy was something that was spoken by men that were prophets, words that were prediction of events that are yet to happen from the point in time which they spoke them. And so when we read of such incidents, which have been spoken at a point in time, and then we read also in the Bible of latter fulfilment of them, or if we read in history books a fulfilment of prophecies which have been spoken of the Bible, that serves to build our confidence in the veracity of the Bible message. Well, firstly, I suppose we could ask ourselves a question, what is a prophet? Well, a prophet was someone that spoke prophecies. And we have perhaps an example of that. If you come over with me to 1 Corinthians and chapter 14. There, there, were, there were prophecies, yes, but there were also something more than that. And 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is a chapter where the Apostle Paul is talking about the use of the Holy Spirit gifts. That different members of the ecclesias, the, the group of believers in Paul's day had. They were called ecclesias. All of the apostles, the 12 apostles from the Lord Jesus Christ had all of the gifts and different members in the ecclesia had one or two of these gifts. And one of the gifts was the gift of prophecy. And so the apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 3 we read, But he that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. So what was the purpose of prophesying according to the apostle Paul? Edification strengthening in knowledge or building up one's faith, exhortation, encouragement to each other and comfort to console each other. So here we have the idea of the message which the prophet gave was principally we could perhaps say he bubbled up with excitement about the word of God, about the things which he spoke. So the idea of this verse then, we're, we're given a picture of someone that not only speaks about things that are yet going to happen, things that are to the future of the time which he's speaking, but he's excited about what he's speaking. And so he more than foretells, he foretells about what's going to happen from that point in time on. Come back with me now to Exodus chapter 18. We're just going to have a look at a couple of examples of prophets in the Bible and what they have done and what they've said and why they're called prophets. So we get a picture of what a prophet is. In Exodus chapter 18, we have described for us here another characteristic of a prophet. And while the quote that we're going to look at doesn't say it's about Moses, and while it doesn't say in this quote that he is a prophet, uh, we know from Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse 10 where it says, There arose not a prophet in is since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. So come back with me then to Exodus 18. And we read there in Exodus 18 and verse 13, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from the morning unto the evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, what is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning unto even? And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of God. When they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. And so here we have another reason for the prophets. The people went to the prophet if they wished to find out something from God when they had a matter, for instance, that they wished to have judgment decided on. They went to the prophet. He inquired on their behalf to God 
God replied to the prophet, and the people were then told an answer or a judgment to whatever it was they had inquired about. So here we have a person who inquires on behalf of the common people. Come back with me now to uh, Genesis chapter 20. Here in Genesis 20 we have another example of a man who's here called a prophet. Genesis 20, and we read in verse 1 of who's been spoken of there, and it says, Abraham. He's the man which Genesis 20 is talking about. And we jump down now to verse 7, and we read there in verse 7, Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. So here we're told not only that Abraham is a prophet, but what he's going to do as a prophet. It's not speaking in this verse anything about him speaking any prophecies. He's not foretelling the future. But here, he's to act as a mediator between uh, this man Abimelech, which, we, uh, which is in, recorded in verse 3, and God in regard to an unconscious sin that Abimelech had committed for taking another man's wife. And so here the purpose that we've looked at this quote is we have another function that the prophets performed. The prophet here acted as a mediator between God and man. A person who could seek forgiveness for one's sins to pray to God on, behalf, on another person's behalf. Come back with me or come over now to Exodus chapter 7. We look at an example a couple of quotes back which concern Moses as a prophet. And here we're going to read of an example, a different characteristic of a prophet, and here it's also in relation to Moses. Exodus chapter 7, and we read in verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he sent the children of Israel out of his land. We looked at Moses before, but, and we read that there was no prophet like unto him, the quote that we, we, uh, I had on the screen in Deuteronomy 34. And yet here Moses himself has a prophet uh, that acts on his behalf. He acts as a spokesman. And so God here speaks to Moses, Moses to Aaron, and Aaron to Pharaoh. And you might ask yourself, why does this happen this way? And the reason for this is that Moses didn't consider himself to be a person that was very good at public speaking. Because he said earlier in Exodus, I am not eloquent, I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And so then in summary, in looking at those couple of quotes uh, of examples of prophets in the Bible, we can see then that a prophet was a judge, a mediator, a spokesman, a person that forthrightly foretold the future and instructed and encouraged the people on how to walk in God's ways. That was the characteristics of a prophet and the actions which they took. Well, now we'll have a look at the benefits to all people who choose to read, to consider and to take action based on Bible prophecies. Come over with me to Amos chapter 3. And I suppose we could ask ourselves the question, do we need to know the prophecies of God? What purpose is it in knowing the prophecies of God? Well, Bible prophecies are especially given to the servants of God that they may know and that they may understand what God is going to do. And we read in Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. If we wish to know what God is going to do in the future, what he is going to do with this earth, then that is revealed to us in this book, the Bible. And it's just up to us, as it is up to all men, to read, to understand, and also to order our lives thereby. Come with me next over to Psalm 103. Psalm 103 is an interesting verse because here is a verse speaking again about Moses, uh, the man who we looked at earlier. 
and we read in Psalm 103 and verse 7, he that is God, uh, from the previous verse, he made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. And so in this verse, we have two different groups of people. We have Moses and we have the children of Israel, the people who Moses led out of Israel, out of Egypt, rather, through the power of God. As well as two different groups of people, we have two different actions that are performed, two actions of God. And the two different people understood God through these two different actions. And it's interesting when we look at them. The first one we have is ways. The ways of God, it says, were made known unto Moses. But the acts of God were made known unto the children of Israel. Ways is a word and it means direction, habit, manner, course of life or moral character. Whereas acts means deeds or things a person has done. So in effect, Moses understood the direction God was heading, the future. Whereas the children of Israel, all they, all they knew, all they understood was the things that God had done in the past. They could see, uh, find out what had happened in the past, but Moses could see which direction God was heading. Perhaps come over with me now to Revelation chapter 1, because we're talking about understanding the benefits to us of knowing the prophecies of God. And here we've got a specific verse which refers, uh, bestows a particular blessing on those who understand certain prophecies of God. Revelation is the last book of the Bible. And we're told of its authorship in verse 1. We read Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And so here is the book of Revelation, a book that was a record of things that were to occur from the time which it was written, and it was written approximately AD 96, from, it was the things that would occur from that point in time, from there unto our present day, and even from our present day, well into the future. And so for those who choose to read this book, to take the time to listen to what has been said and to take notice of obeying the instructions thereof, there is given that a special blessing because we're told at the beginning of verse 3, blessed. And it's to he who readeth, he who heareth, and he who keeps those things that are contained therein. Well, I thought tonight for the rest of the evening that we have here, we'll look at some of the prophecies that have been given in the Bible, broken into those that have already had a fulfilment, and uh, so that we may be educated on what God is going to do in the earth when we come to look at those prophecies which are yet to be fulfilled. We're just going to have a look at a small couple of prophecies to start with. So come back with me to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to have a look at a verse here which is perhaps not always taken as a prophecy, but it is, it, it is a prophecy. It's a forecast of what is going to happen from the point in time in which it was spoken. And here we are in the Garden of Eden. The Lord God here gives instructions to uh, the man that he has created, Adam, in the day in which he created him. And so we read in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day in which thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Uh, if you've got a Bible like mine, a King James Oxford, in the margin it has Hebrew, dying thou shalt die. So it doesn't mean that in the day that Adam ate of the forbidden fruit, should he do it, that he would die. But rather, in the day in which he ate the forbidden fruit, he would change from a creature that was not subject to dying at that point to one that would eventually die. And so disobedient man, uh, uh, man Adam, or his, uh, Adam here, would return to the dust. Well, that's the prophecy as well as it being a command with a judgment for disobedience. And so we ask the question, was it fulfilled? Well, we come over to the next chapter, and we come over to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. 
and we read part way through verse six. Uh, sorry, at the end of verse six, and he did eat. So Adam ate of the forbidden fruit. What happened? Anything? Well, yes, something happened. We come down to we read in verse seven, in the middle of the verse, and they knew that they were naked. That knowledge was revealed to them somehow. We come down to verse 10 and we read in the middle of the verse, and I was afraid. So it's the second thing that happened to Adam. And lastly, we read in verse 17 to 19, this is God speaking unto Adam. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And so Adam is told there by God that he would start to be a dying creature from the time that he dissipated. And that is what happened. From that point in time, he started to go downhill and degrade back into the dust from whence he came. And last we will read of Adam across in chapter 5 and verse 5. And we read there, and all the days, of Ad all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. And so there's the fulfilment of that prophecy from Genesis chapter 2. Come with me now across to 1 Kings chapter 11. Just a second in our examples of uh, small prophecies which we are going to look at tonight. In 1 Kings chapter 11 we have a prophecy which was given during the reign of King Solomon, the, uh, king, the uh, third king of Israel, the son of David. Solomon towards the end of his reign had slipped from being a faithful king and had started worshipping other gods than uh, Yahweh who was the God of Israel. And so we read, con read concerning this in 1 Kings Chapter 11 and from verse 29. And it came to pass at the time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah the Shinonite found him in the way. And he had clad himself with a new garment, and they two were alone in the field. And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it in twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take thee ten pieces. For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will rent the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give ten tribes unto thee. And come down now to verse 38. And it shall be if thou would hearken unto all that I command thee, and wilt walk in my ways, and do that is right in my sight, and keep my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant did, that I will be with thee, and build thee a sure house, as I built for David, and will give Israel unto thee. So what happened? In summary, Jeroboam, when he came to the throne, set up an idol at the north end of his kingdom and one at the south end. He established priests to minister to those idols, which were not of the required order of priests, as according to the law of Moses, for the purpose that his subjects wouldn't have to go down south to Jerusalem to worship, where they were required to worship under the law of God. Jerusalem was only about 20 kilometres away from Bethel. Two years into the reign of Jeroboam's son, another man from the kingdom of Israel rose up against the king, killed him and all the other descendants of Jeroboam. And we have that just come across uh, a couple of chapters into chapter 15. And we read there in 1 Kings chapter 15 and verse 29. Uh, verse 27 tells us who we're talking about. It's Baasha. And it says, And it came to pass, when he reigned, he smote all the house of Jeroboam. He left not to Jeroboam any that breathed, until he had destroyed him, according to the saying of the law which he spoke by his servant Ahijah the Shalonite. Because of the sins of Jeroboam which he sinned, and which he made Israel sin, by his provocation wherewith he provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger. And so there we have a prophecy given to Jeroboam. It was given as a command, and also a prophecy uh, if he obeyed the command and a prophecy if he disobeyed. 
He disobeyed, and there we have the fulfilment of that prophecy given the judgment for disobedience. Well, I'd also like to look at a couple of prophecies tonight which are perhaps of a, a larger nature in terms of the amount of time. They're prophecies given by the prophets of the Old Testament, and we wish to see whether those, prophets were, whether those prophecies were fulfilled, and also to what level of precision. Well, come over with me to the chapter which uh, our chairman read for us tonight, Ezekiel chapter 26. And he, Ezekiel chapter 26 is principally a prophecy concerning Tyre. And we have recorded for us in verse 2, Ezekiel 26, verse 2. Son of man, because the Tyreth has said against Jerusalem, Aha, she is broken that was the gates of the people, she is turned unto me, I shall be replenished, now she is laid waste. Uh, we perhaps first ask the question, why on earth has caused such hatred of Tyre towards Israel? We'll come back to 2 Kings chapter 23. Here we read of one of the kings of Judah, Josiah by name, who was a faithful king to his God, and in his zeal to serve his God, he went up and removed false worship that was extant north of him in the kingdom of Israel, which had been carried off into captivity. And so we read in 2 Kings 23 and verse 15. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel, that's, as I said before, only about 20 kilometres north of Jerusalem where Josiah was reigning, and the high place which Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made, both that altar and the high place, he broke down and burned the high place, stabbed it small to powder, and burned the grove. So here was the false worship. They were set up by Jeroboam, was purported to serve the true God, but it was not, it was against God's laws. And he destro destroyed also uh, that which the priests, the false priests, used to use for worship. And we come now down to verse 19. He heads from Bethel north up to Samaria. And in verse 19 we read, And all the houses also of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made to provoke the Lord to anger, Josiah took away and did to them according to all the acts that he had done in Bethel. And he slew all the priests of the high places that were upon the altars, and burned men's bones upon them, and returned to Jerusalem. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom for a period of time, but at the time of Josiah they had been taken off into captivity. Not only did they for some period of time falsely worship Yahweh through the God of Israel, through the false calves which Jeroboam built at Dan and Bethel, but under the reign of Ahab they started worshipping Baal which was a god of one of the other nations. It was these high places that I believe Josiah removed in verses 19 and 20. Baal came into Israel through the wife of Ahab, Jezebel, because we're told that Jezebel came from the area of Tyre and Sidon. And it was this that caused Tyre's hatred toward Israel. From the point of view of the Tyrians, the, this Josiah from Judah was destroying their gods, and in their view, it was an act of sacrilege. They couldn't believe their luck, though, that's the Tyrians, when only 13 years after Josiah uh, cleaned up the uh, false worship in verses 19 and 20 of chapter 23, Josiah was killed in a war with Egypt. And we read that in verse 29 of uh, 1 Kings 23, where we read, In his days, Pharaoh king of Egypt, went up against the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates, and the king Josiah went out against him, and he, was, and he slew him at Megiddo when he had seen him. After this King Josiah in Judah, there were no more faithful kings. Only uh, after another 22 and a half years, the kingdom of Judah was destroyed and taken away into Babylon. With that as background then, come back with me to Ezekiel chapter 26. And that, I believe, is the background and the reason for verse 2 that we read before in Ezekiel 26. Tyre laughed against Jerusalem. She is broken. And so we then come now down to the prophecy that's given. And we have uh, two, uh, three groups of prophecies here. We have in verses, uh, uh, in terms of the, per per the, the person who's going to execute the prophecies. In verses 3 to 6, we have 
what I might call the they prophecies. And I've endeavoured to emphasise the they, and it's the they is referring to many nations. And so we read in verse 4 that it's many nations. Sorry, verse 3. Many nations, and then verse 4, they shall destroy. Verse 5. Sorry, verse 4, they shall destroy. Verse 5, at the end of the verse, the nations. And verse 6, again, they shall know that I am the Lord. So it's referring to many nations and not just one nation. And then we come to the next section of the prophecy, verses 7 to 11. Now in verse 7, it specifically says to us that it's speaking of, in the, the third line down there, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a king of kings. So it's a specific person. And then... For the remaining few verses there, through to verse 11, we have, he shall slay, he shall make a fort, he shall set up engines of war, his axes, he shall break down their thy towers, his horses, he shall enter thy gates, his horses again in verse 11, and he shall slay thy people with the sword. It's all referring to Nebuchadnezzar. Now Nebuchadnezzar's empire was a land-based power. He came and removed the tire that was on the mainland from being a city. It's called by some the old tower. He removed the people that were there, but he didn't completely remove all the buildings. They were just left there, destroyed. And so we come now down to verses 12 to 14, and we're back again as I've highlighted the word they there. It's not referring to Nebuchadnezzar because the pronoun has changed to the plural. They shall make us to boil, they shall break down thy walls, they shall load thy stones, etc. It's referring to a different group of people to verses 11, uh, 7 to 11. According to Herodotus, King Hiram, Herodotus was a Greek historian, a King Hiram in the 10th century BC joined up uh, two sandstone reefs. I've just got a map on there of that, that's the island uh, after he's done this, but he started off with two sandstone reefs. He, filled, uh, he brought landfill out there. And enlarged the island to approximately what you see there, about 40 acres or 16 hectares. That island was gradually exceeded, uh, uh, increased in size. There were ports on the north and south of it, and a city was uh, established there. And it essentially became a commercial and religious centre, but it was dependent on food and water from the land based city of Tyre, which was called by some the Old Tyre. Now, when Nebuchadnezzar came along, he laid seed to the mainland city. He removed complete, uh, the, the Tyrians removed completely over to the island and they set up that as their city and it became essentially a new Tyre. That was a very short time period when Nebuchadnezzar came down after this prophecy was given. As verse 8 record, recorded for us, it said... He will make a fort against thee and cast a mount against thee. He laid siege to this city of Tyre on the mainland for 13 years. Tyre was a maritime power. Yes, it was affected by losing its land, uh, its land base, but it was not destroyed. And it built itself up again as a maritime power. They literally removed their wealth to the island fortress and effectively laughed at Nebuchadnezzar to an extent. And so, in verse 4, we had the following uh, mentioned, They shall destroy the walls of Tyre, and break down her towers, and shall scrape her dust from her, and make her like the top of a rock. The top of a rock is completely bare. Nebuchadnezzar did not remove all the buildings from old Tyre. They were left there. In verse 12, we're told... They sh at the end of that verse there, they shall lay thy stones and thy timbers and thy dust in the midst of the water. Nebuchadnezzar did not take the stones and the timber and the dust and put it in the water. Verse 14 records, and thou shalt make it like the top of the rock, again as we're told from verse 4, and thou shalt, uh, thou shalt be a place to spread nets on. That was not done after Nebuchadnezzar came down. And uh, in verse 17, we're told, 
Thou, thou art to be destroyed. That was in the habit of seafaring men. So thou art to be destroyed. Tyre was not destroyed. The maritime power rose again. And for 250 years, Tyre remained on the island as a maritime power. It seemed like Ezekiel's prophecy was grossly exaggerated. Contrary to the requirements of the properties, the stones, the timber and the dust of the ancient city had not been thrown to the sea, as predicted. The site had not been made bare like the top of a rock, nor had the Tyrian power been irreparably broken. And on the contrary, the riches of the world flowed through the gates to the east of Tyre, and the Tyrian influence, influence rose once again to its previous eminence. Concerning the greatness of this city, Wikipedia records, the commerce of the ancient world was gathered into the warehouses of Tyre. Tyrian merchants were the first who ventured to navigate the, the Mediterranean waters. They founded their colonies on the coasts and neighbouring neighboring islands of the Aegean Sea in Greece, on the northern coast of Africa, at Carthage and in other places, in Sicily and Corsica, in Spain at Tartessus, and even beyond the pillars of Hercules at Gadaria. They went out into the Atlantic. And so it must have seen for 250 years between Nebuchadnezzar and Alexander that Ezekiel's prophecy had failed, or the very best grossly been exaggerated. But friends, God is never in a hurry. Delay in prophecies is a challenge to the faith of the servants of God. We could say at last time made a mistake. It took opposition to Alexander the Great. He came down to this island fortress, protected by its powerful navy, surrounded by the blue waters of the Mediterranean. And the Tyrians thought they could defy his land forces. But they took on a man, they didn't know about God's prophecy concerning them, but they took on a man who was determined he was going to bring Tyre into their control. But he was a land force and had to do so, he had to get his land forces out to this island. And so he built a ramp. He connected the mainland with the island across which his soldiers could march. And that's the map as we see of Tyre today. He pushed the the stones and all the, the um, building materials from Old Tower and he pushed that into the water and so made a ramp in which his soldiers could get across there. As a consequence of that invasion, the second part of verse 12 was fulfilled, where we read in the last couple of lines there, he laid the stones and the timber and the dust in the midst of the water. And also in verse 14, where it says, it shall be a place to spread nets upon. And so nets could be spread out from the causeway, which was the stones of the old city. Well, the prophecy was not still completely fulfilled. Tyre still continued as a city under the following world empires. And it was not fulfilled until 1291 AD, when the Mameluk Muslims took it and reduced it to ashes. It is recorded that the policy of these people was to make their destruction so severe that the Crusaders would not be tempted to ever reoccupy. But they were also fulfilling Bible prophecy. Tyre then, and only then, became destitute of inhabitants. And only then was the prophecy completely fulfilled. A prophecy that was given early in the 6th century BC and seemed like the prophet for nearly 2,000 years had made a very exaggerated prophecy. For over 250 years, there was nothing like verse 12 or verse 14's fulfilment. And it was not until late 13th century AD before it was completely fulfilled, nearly 1900 years later. But that's time. I believe one of the greatest prophecies that are made in the Bible, and uh, when I say prophecy, I'm not talking about one prophecy, but group of prophecies are concerning the little nation of Israel. And I'd just like to spend a couple of minutes on a summary of a quick summary of prophecies concerning that nation. It's a nation in the world today that covers about 20,000 square kilometres, compared with Australia of about 7.7 .7 million square kilometres. Nearly 350 times larger Australia is, yet the GDP of our, country, our nation is only 3.6 times larger. By and large, the world today, it seems as anti-Semitic, and in support of that, I would, uh, we look at the UN resolutions. Since 1947, UN resolutions to allow the Jews to settle in Palestine. Since that point in time, there have been 226 UN Security Council resolutions against Israel. 
280 General Assembly resolutions and 45 uh, United Nations Human Rights Council resolutions. And all of these friends are in essence a failure of the world, of the UN, which is all the nations of the world, a failure of the world to accept Israel's rightful existence in the land promised to its fathers, initially to Abraham. Well, what is prophesied concerning Israel? We're not going to go through all of those prophecies. It will be such a, a lecture could be based on that and not fulfil that. Uh, they are so many. Well, come with me over to uh, Jeremiah chapter 30, because I think the prophecies concerning Israel are summarised in a verse in this chapter. In Jeremiah chapter 30, we read in verse 11. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee. Yet I will not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. And so here I believe we've got a prophecy which summarises God's attitude towards the Jewish people, God's prophecies concerning the Jewish people. God gave them a land. They went into the land of Canaan after they came out of Egypt. They were at the northern, the northern, uh, they split into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom was taken away under the, uh, under the Assyrian Empire, the southern kingdom under the Babylonian Empire. Then came the Greeks and the Romans. And then the Romans, they, they, uh, um, they came, after they went to Babylon, they came back to Israel and they were eventually scattered under the Romans in AD 70 at the siege of Jerusalem. Where are all those empires today? Where's the Babylonian Empire? Where's the Assyrians? Where's the Romans? There are none of those empires extant in the world today. Yet God says, I won't make a full end of thee. Come over with me to John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, the Lord Jesus Christ, in his ministries on this earth, he went through a town called Samaria. And in Samaria there were a, were a group of people who weren't, they weren't Jewish by origin, and they had a religion which was not properly uh, the, the Jews' religion. They thought they practiced the laws based on uh, part of the Old Testament, but it wasn't quite that in truth. And the Lord Jesus Christ there speaks with a woman from that town, and he says in verse 22, uh, under the question that she asked him, where should she worship? The place where her people worshipped or the place where the Jews worshipped. And he says in John 4, 22, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. And I think it's important that we remember that statement there. Salvation is of the Jews. And so on that basis, come back with me to Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, we have a record of God calling out Abram. He was the ancestor of the Jewish people, and he used to live in Ur, which today uh, I think is in Iraq. And when he went to bring Abram out, he gives this command, this message to Abram, and we read in Genesis chapter 12 and from verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Uh, come over with me to chapter 13. And we read there, uh, because we ask the question perhaps, where is this land that, is, uh, that Abram was given? And we read in chapter 13 and verse 3, and at this point in time, we're told there he's at Bethel. He went on his journey, so that's Genesis 13, verse 3, from the south, even to Bethel, under the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai. It's about 20 kilometres north of Jerusalem. And come down now to verse 14. And we read there, And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed 
forever. And so Abram's told there that all that he could see from that place would be given to him and to his seed. Come with me over now to Galatians chapter 3. Because the interesting thing about this promise and the connection with ourselves is the Apostle Paul picks up that verse, the last, uh, last phrase there of verse, uh, Genesis 12 and verse 3, and he quotes that with an interesting commentary. Galatians 3 and verse 8. And Paul says there, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, and now he quotes the words straight out of Genesis 12 and verse 3, In thee shall all nations be blessed. There's a slight change to the wording there, uh, from all families of the earth to all nations, but it means the same thing. And so from the use of this promise given to Abram by the Apostle Paul here in Galatians, we are to understand that the gospel is very much a message, a teaching which is indelibly involved with Israel and with the Jewish people. Because we're told that it's the gospel that was preached to Abraham and in the gospel, therefore, involves the promises to Abraham. Well, back in the start of the history of the nation of Israel, as they travelled from Egypt up to the land of Canaan, as it was then known, Moses, just before he died and just before the people of Israel entered into their land of promise, laid out a prophecy of the nation of Israel in the form of blessings if they obeyed the commands of God, and he recorded it for them. Blessings if they obeyed the commands of God, and so that that was what was going to happen if they did that, and also curses if they disobeyed the command of God. Come back with me then to Deuteronomy chapter 28. And in Deuteronomy 28, we have a list of many of the events which happened to the nation of Israel. It's a prophecy of what happened to Israel because they failed to keep the commands that Moses recorded from God for them to keep. And it goes through in Deuteronomy 28 and describes the actions of the various powers that came against Israel. Until finally the capital of Israel, Jerusalem, was besieged and completely destroyed by the Romans. This siege was completed in AD 70. And it's described in the latter part here of Deuteronomy chapter 28. And we read in verse 49 concerning the people that were to partake in the siege. And we read there, The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. So how do we get out of that? That it was the Romans. The nation from the end of the earth. Well, Rome was a nation, that, uh, a city that was from the other end of the then now world. As swift as the eagle flies. Wikipedia says Romans used the eagle on the standards of their armies. And a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Latin's considered by, one of, uh, by people to be one of the hardest languages there is to learn. If you choose to dispute that, you just need to Google Latin, a hard language. And you'll see what comes up there. And so here I believe we've got evidence that we're clearly talking and precisely talking about the Roman Empire. What did they do? We come down to verse 52. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates, unto thy high and fenced walls come down, wherein thou trustest, throughout all thy land. He shall besiege thee in all thy gates, throughout all thy land, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, and the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee in the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee. And verse 55, So that he will not give to any of them of the flesh of his children whom he shall eat, because he hath nothing left him in the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee in all thy gates. And it's, it's, it's horrible reading, those words. But the Romans came down and they besieged that city until eventually there was nothing to eat inside and people ate themselves. They ate their children. So bad was the siege that they, a person could take their child, kill it, cook it and eat it. Or maybe not even cook it. After the siege, the prophecy continues. And we come down, down to verse 64. And we're told there, and the, Lord shall, and the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations thou shalt find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart, 
and failing of eyes and sorrow of mind. And so God was yet going to bring them at that point in time when this prophecy was given. They were yet to be brought into the land that was promised to their fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. And there, here, Moses, through this prophecy, is saying to them, if they fail to keep his commands, the commands of God that he was going to give to them, that's what's going to happen. Well, it came to pass about 1,500 years later. And then after that point in time of AD 70, so that's the first century AD, we've got until the 20th century AD before there's a, a, a start to be a fulfilment of verse 64, or the scattered when they're to be restored. It wasn't until the end of the 19th century AD that there were murmurings in the world about finding a future homeland for the Jewish people. Well, Moses also wrote concerning things that have happened uh, last century, if we come up, jump over to chapter 30 and verse 3, about the regathering of the Jewish people. And in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 3 we read, that then the Lord thy God shall turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. And so there we have it. The prophecies of Moses, they would be in captivity for a period of time, but eventually would be regathered. But even those prophecies have not yet had a complete fulfilment. Come back to the previous verse to Deuteronomy 30 and verse 2. And we read there, And thou shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice, according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul. At this point in time, although many of the Jews in the land claim to worship God, many are secular. They, yes, they accept that there was the God of the Old Testament, but whether he's interested in them today, well, they're not quite sure. There are those who are called Orthodox and Ultra-Orthodox, but they don't see Jesus as the seed of Abraham that is spoken of in Genesis 22 and verse 18 in the promises to Abraham where we read Abram in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed and we'll look at that verse in a couple of minutes to see that that's Jesus Christ and so there will come a time when the Jews in Israel those who are living there this verse will be fulfilled in Deuteronomy 30 verse 2 and they will come and understand and accept Jesus as the Messiah as the seed of Abraham spoken in the promises of the Old Testament, and they will obey God's voice concerning all his commands. Well, come with me over to Galatians chapter 3, because we've looked at things that have been prophesied of, and now we're going to look at things that have been are yet to be fulfilled, and in a light of things that have great import to us, promises that we can be involved in. We looked at Galatians chapter 3 before, and we're now going to look at some verses towards the end of that chapter. Here in Galatians 3, we have a connection with a promise to Abraham from Genesis 12, as we looked at in verse 8. And towards the end of that chapter, we'll see those who become involved with God's plan of salvation through Jesus Christ is also in, connected with a promise to Abraham. And so we read in Galatians 3 at verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. And we come now down to verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you have been baptised into Christ to put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Well, who are those that Paul is speaking of here? Are those in Christ in verses 26 to 29? Verse 22. Them that believe. The last few verses there. We read in verse 27. Those who have been baptised into Christ. Verse 26. Those who have faith in Christ Jesus. And verse 28, there are no other physical requirements. It matters not for your nationality. It matters not for your status in life. It matters not whether you're a man or woman. All can be one in Christ Jesus. 
There's one more thing that God requires. Come with me back to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2 and verse 7. To them who by patient continuance in well doing seek for glory and honour and immortality, to those people will be given eternal life. It's those who by patient continuance in well doing, those are the people it, you must continually seek to do that which is right according to God's commands. And in closing, we'll just come over with me to Revelation chapter 5, because here is a prophecy, a prophecy for those who do keep God's commands, a prophecy as to what is going to happen. And it's here talks about those who've been redeemed by Jesus Christ and the authority which they will be given to reign with him on the earth. Revelation chapter 5, and we read in verse 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take, the, to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So hopefully then, friends, you can see from the prophecies that we considered in the Bible tonight that the Bible is a book that can be relied on. Being able then to rely on it, we can take hold of the prophecies that are recorded for the future and trust in them just as if they had been already fulfilled purely because God has said they will be. And we've looked at Galatians 3 which shows us that we can be connected to those promises, the promises made to, to Abraham of old. And we can consider ourselves to be part of that future if we take hold of a life in Jesus Christ.